So let's, let's pivot to the NCCN guidelines. Uh, NCCN guidelines uh, inform reimbursement, uh, certainly our educational on how we treat our patients. As you know, the NCCN guidelines were updated on March 11th, 2020. Uh, you, if you think we can't you know, build consensus, although I think we can, <laughs> it, it takes the NCCN 127 pages to tell us how to treat epithelial <laughs> cancer. I think that's impressive. Um, uh, uh, on, on page 11, I think that's the most informative to our conversation here about frontline. And uh, it, it, again, it's entitled epithelial ovarian cancer, fallopian tube cancer, primary peritoneal cancer, uh, and, and what to do frontline. And, and they start with this bifurcation, no bevacizumab use during primary therapy or bevacizumab use during primary therapy. They don't tell us when to do it. There's no preference. They don't say, look, this is when you should use bevacizumab. This is when you not, shouldn't use bevacizumab. I thought that's what the NCCN was supposed to do, was to tell us how to treat our patients. It doesn't do that. So that's why I have Tom Krivak, because I can ask Tom Krivak, since he presented 218, when, when do we use bevacizumab, or when should we, or when shouldn't we? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely correct. When you look at the NCCN guidelines, you'd like to think, how, how should we, you know, who gets bev, who doesn't? And... Um, I kind of like how it is. It's it's nebulous, so we can <laughs> everybody can kind of say I'm right and you're wrong, and, and look at the NCCN. So to me, I, I you know how do I use bevacizumab? I use it by the label. I, I think surgical debulk is important, but if you have stage three, four ovarian cancer, you're going to get bevacizumab up front and then tailor the maintenance therapy. Obviously, that's not what the NCCN says. They have a very nice algorithm where they look at upfront use versus, uh, you know, looking in the maintenance phase and then looking at BRCA mutations, wild type or not, and germline, and, and then going through their complete response versus partial response and how you could potentially use bevacizumab, like you said, Brad, as the building block to potentially add a PARP or to use, you know, PARP alone. But to, to me, what I like about the NCCN guidelines is that they say, you can use BEV however you want to, basically up front, an upfront ovarian cancer, as well as we really need to be testing these folks. And then we should really stratify based off the testing. So it's kind of taken all the data that we've discussed in allowing us to, to say for certain tumors, they're going to get bevacizumab alone for that patient. And for other patients, they're going to get a combination for other patients, they're going to get single agent heart mutation. So they've done a nice job of covering all their bases for how we have uh, our biases with how we want to treat So it creates four cells. So you have the bifurcation bevacizumab, yes, no. And then each one of those cells, it has germline somatic BRCA or not. Right. And, it, and, and unknown is in the, in the you know, no mutation subgroup. Yeah. And so, so, so now all of a sudden you have four cells and we can sort of work through them is that if you don't have bevacizumab, which is at least 50% or about 50% of the patients, and you have a BRCA mutation, you need Solo1 or Prima. And it gives you both of those options. Again, no BEV, BRCA mutation, Solo1 or Prima, category one. Pretty easy. If you're, if you're no Bevacizumab and you're wild type or unknown, then it gives you the option observe or Prima, which is niraparib. And then there's a footnote, footnote F. And footnote F says that in the absence of a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, HRD status may provide information on the magnitude of the benefit of the PARP inhibitor. But it's a category 2B. And so we'll, we'll see as the labels become clear, as the reimbursement becomes clear, um, but they also don't tell us should you do the HRD test? Yes, no. They don't tell us when to do it. They just say that if you do it, it's a 2B and it might be helpful. Do you guys have any comments on that without bevacizumab? Do you agree with that? Uh, we've kind of gone through the assay, but, but you like this, Tom Krivak? Tom Herzog, how do, you, how do you work through that? Is this informative or, or, or not? Yeah, I mean, I, it's been a month or so since I've read them, um, but I thought you summarized them well, and I know that it was category 2B in terms of the HRD. Um, I, I think one of the other things, did I, did I misread them that it also included stage two? Um, yeah, it does. It does. It's quite interesting, right? Because Brilliant. these studies are all stage three, four. Uh, <laughs> so, so just, just saying, just uh, saying, I like yeah, it. Just saying. Um, but I, but I think Brad, you've taught us that one decision affects the other decision, right? 
So if, if you make that first decision, your real first decision is, are you going to operate right away or are you going to give chemo and then operate? Um, and then if you're going to operate right away, okay, that takes you, then your next decision, or if you're going to do neoadjuvant, your next decision is BEV or no BEV. Mm -hmm. and, and then now with all this new data from Prima Apollo 1, and how are we going to incorporate that? And because now you've really got to make some decisions. You're going to add to the BEV. Um, are, are some people going to, when they get their HRD information back, stop BEV, even if the patient's responding well, and then uh, start a PARP as maintenance? So it's going to be very interesting to see what people do with, with uh, the information because it's also going to be temporal in terms of when you're getting this information and when you test. So obviously the sooner the better so that you can make the best decision for the patient. But I, I found the NCCN guidelines um, pretty interesting and, and uh, I think nebulous was a, a good way of uh, wording it. 